go ahead and get started. Probably have a couple more people filter in here. So last time we, we talked about um, essentially reaction, reactions in reactors. Took a look at mass balances for those and it talked a little bit about what it looks like. Um, some review here in terms of how to put in the reaction term into a mass balance that has a reactor of some sort with the reaction. Uh, so I wanted to follow that up. Uh, we also talked a little bit about how to derive uh, kind of the kinetics of a reaction given a batch reactor or you could derive it with a more complicated reactor. You just have to have good knowledge of the flow and whatever else is happening in the system. Um, you could still solve for the K, for example. Uh, so today I'd like to go, go through how we characterize the hydraulics of these reactors. So it's important whether we're dealing with a, an ideal reactor or a non-ideal reactor, we need to know what that flow looks like, what are our tools to understand that flow, and what we're going to do about that. So that's, that's basically what I want to cover today. Uh, I think last time I briefly showed you this example of the kind of the dye flowing through the, the plug flow case. And so we'll use that example again today. Um, so essentially we have two different ways of dealing with the, the hydraulics. Um, we can either use a supercomputer and do computational fluid dynamics through the whole system, try to have an understanding, and maybe this doesn't quite require a supercomputer, but it, it's certainly computationally intensive. If you're to even just model this small system here, accounting for differences in flow um, and viscosity, whatever, whatever's happening, the drag forces on the edges, in order to account for all of that, you need a pretty um, robust and uh, high resolution model to, to simulate it properly. So the computational fluid dynamics is important. Um, it's potentially quite useful, but it's also a um, highly intensive means of checking what's happening within a reactor. And we generally want to confirm that, hey, this is actually what's happening. So if we were to set up a small scale treatment plant or even a large scale treatment plant, and then you want to know something about the hydraulics, you don't go straight to the computational fluid dynamics. Um, maybe you would, you would do that if you're designing a unit process that you're going to repeat a, a bunch of times and sell to, sell to everybody. Um, and then that, in that case, you might want to do that compare it with tracer tests um, and validate the fact that yes, this system is acting like you think it is and your model's working. It's just um, not, not what you think of when you're, you're going to show up to a tr treatment plant and figure out what's going on with it, right? So we need something a little more practical and that's where our analysis of residence time distributions comes in. And in a way, the, the computational method is giving us that same information. We, we could use it to give us a residence time distribution. But when I say these RTDs, residence time distributions here, really what I'm talking about is using some sort of a tracer to observe how long is the water staying in the reactor. So uh, as this example below here, so we'll use a die or some other tracer that we can measure. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, essentially to identify how long is the water residing in the, in the reactor. Um, okay, so we can, we can look at this residence time in two, um, in two forms. One, we could look at the exit age. So the age of the water, I say age, that's what is commonly used here if it was born when the, it entered the reactor, how old is it when it leaves, right? That's the exit age sort of thing, the, the age of the water within the system. So the exit age distribution, meaning we start adding a dye or a tracer, how, 
how much time has gone by before that particular dye molecule exits. And so then we'll get some sort of distribution. Uh, in this case, they're continuously adding. We're going to talk about that more. That's called a step addition. We, we went from no tracer to we stepped up to a full amount of tracer being added. Um, if we were looking at kind of a y-axis of concentration here. And in this case, sorry, in this case, we have a little bit of the dye coming in, um, coming out earlier. So if we were looking at the, the age at which the dye is coming out, a little bit of it would appear at an early age. And then it would slowly climb until um, we have the full concentration of it coming out uh, later. We can look at this in terms of that specific age. So we're looking at that molecule. That one came out at this particular age. And we can also look at it in terms of the cumulative amount, so cumulative age distribution, at the cumulative amount of dye that has come through at some given time. This, this will make a little more sense when we look at just a pulse instead of a step here, or if we just added a drop of dye, how much of that dye comes out? We could look at that in terms of a specific age per molecule or a cumulative, at what point have we um, accumulated all of the dye that we added uh, has come out of the system. So these will be our ET and F of T functions. Okay, so we're going to start with the, the E of T, this exit age. So essentially, the time at which dye exists in the reactor, um, excuse me, the, the time the time that the, a given dye molecule existed in the reactor. Um, and I'm just going to correct that really quick. So, that'll be more clear time that the, the dye existed in the reactor, so it's some amount of time that it, it was there. Um, all right. And so a lot of times what we want is how much of the dye, what fraction of the dye has come through the reactor after a, a, a given amount of time. So how much, you know, what fraction of the water remains after 10 minutes of, you know, since we added the dye, or how much has gone by within the first five minutes. So we, we often want to know what fraction is there, or um, some indication of given what we think is the hydraulic resonance time, if we were to take the, the volume over the flow rate, V over Q, um, in reality, how does that compare to uh, how much has actually gone through? So if we take a look at a, a typical graph of E of t, it will probably look something like this, where we have, over time, we have a growth in the amount of dye that's coming through, and we reach some peak, and then start coming back down, and probably have some tailing of dye coming through. And this would be, you know, perhaps a plug flow reactor that is um, nowhere near ideal. And the, the picture we were just looking at a moment ago in that little video we saw that that might be a good representation, right? That's a, we can see clearly that the we don't have a perfectly mixed plug coming through it. Um, there's some disruption there. So perhaps if we were to do that that uh, input, the dye would be coming through. We get some peak, the highest concentration, and then it would be declining again and tailing off. So we can look at this um, if we if we define uh, the number of dye molecules in the system that have come through at some time t, we call that n, then the way we can define this E of t graph, or that exit age, is E of t is essentially that dn dt, so how, how that number that has crossed through the system is changing over time, divided by this 
n infinity, which is essentially just all molecules that were labeled. So when, I, when I'm talking about like a labeled molecule, this is the, our tracer, the dye. Sometimes we use fluoride. We could use all sorts of things. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk about what's usually used and why um, in a moment. But essentially what we're going to do is say, given, given that some amount are coming through over time, the a rate, rate at which they're passing through the end point, if we divide that by the total number um, there were in the first place, that gives us this E of T value. So we could look at this um, as an N, just N, um, or we can look at it this, as this E of T. Okay, so if we take a look at trying to integrate this or um, get rid of the derivative here, and separate, we get e of t dt is equal to dn divided by this n infinity. This will give us a way to integrate, and we'll be able to see how this can convert for us into the cumulative um, case. Okay, so this is the exit age, um, just looking at when the dyes are coming out as a function of time, time since we started the, uh, the reaction or the process. Okay, so if we take, um, again, this, this integral that I was just taking a look at, if we integrate it from zero to infinity, this is going to equal one because our total, the total amount of so, so the total fraction, so if we go back and look at this equation up here, the, the dn, how much the n changed, how much n crossed the, the, uh, the finish line, if we divide that by the total number of molecules that we labeled in the first place, if we give it an infinite amount of time, we'll get all the dye molecules back out. It's just a fancy way of saying just that, right? This equation is just saying that, you know, at some given time, a portion of the molecules have gone through, okay? And it depends on how quickly they're coming through. This is how quickly they're coming through. This is the total number. And so when we separate it and do that integration, we know that it's going to be equal to 1 because the total number, so at an infinity, in, at an infinite amount of time, the total number must have passed through, and that's just what it's saying. Okay, so it's a kind of complex way of saying that we, at some point, we have all of the dye molecules come through. Um, and again, this is probably something like that. Okay, one thing we can do here is set some given time and integrate to that time instead. So if we have time one and time two, so if, if the integration of the entire function here is... 1. So this is, this whole thing is this guy, right? And that would be our, our case where the area under that is 1 based on our definition of the system. So instead of doing that, we could say how much comes through between time equals like 5 minutes to time equals um, 15 minutes or something. So we could say, all right, well, what I'm really interested in is, you know, this, this gap which I designed my system for, uh, like, this is my operating range or whatever, how much of this is actually coming through where I think it is. And then we could take the integration of that and see what fraction um, of the water is coming through when I think it is. You know, so that's, that's when we start seeing, okay, some portion of it, um, and that's, that's this here, essentially, is what I just drew, and where really we would label this as, instead of giving actual numbers, we'll say T2 and T1 here. So this gives us a way to say, okay, what portion of the water has come through? And we can also say if our design uh, hydraulic residence time was supposed to be two hours or whatever, how much of the water is actually coming out later than that? Um, 
you know, that gets extra treatment. How much is coming out before that, that gets not enough treatment, for example. So that's, that's why this becomes useful when we um, take a look at it this way. And keep in mind, usually we're going to be dealing with empirical data points. We pulse, you know, we put some dye in and then track it, and we plot this essentially based on, oh, I have a data point here, a data point here, here, and then we just kind of make our best guess at the curve here, and so this integration is probably by hand or by you know, some simplistic numerical method. Um, it's not necessarily uh, the case that we have like a, a well-defined equation that we um, integrate um, with calculus. We, we probably are actually drawing, drawing the area under some curve and calculating it that way. <coughs> Okay, so this is this is the analysis we analyses we get with the exit age. We can work towards moving this into a cumulative age distribution um, by just simply summing the amount of molecules that have come through instead of the um, instead of doing uh, instead of just counting. Okay, this is the exact concentration at this time, right? With, the, the previous, the E of T was that concentration at a given time. And by the way, the, uh, the units here for the exit age function, this is actually per time units. So it's essentially molecules per time uh, because if we take a look here, this, the units in this equation, that dn divided by n, it's a number um, number divided by number, and you're left with just dt there um, on the on the uh, denominator. So that's why we had uh, per time units on this guy. Okay, so then when we're looking at the cumulative age, our units are going to be either the, the cumulative number, or if we transform it, we can um, convert it to the, uh, the f of t function. So we could just look at Okay, how many molecules have come through? And that'll usually look at something like like this, where at some point we reach our total number. And this is going to be either as a, a fraction of the total, it would be end up one, we're approaching the, the total. Um, or this is gonna be n infinity. Right. And so we can go from a number case where we have just that cumulative number. Maybe we added five moles of molecules, so we need five times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Uh, that many molecules, we, we could say that cumulative number there. Or we could just simply divide that by our total number that we added, and that gives us that normalization in, in terms of a fraction. So this would then be our f of t. Uh, function here, which is unitless um, because it's just the, the number over the number. <coughs> okay, so that's that's kind of the, the two ways to, to look at this. Um, I'm going to pull up the book chapter for a moment. The book does go into a lot of detail um, regarding the types of math you can do with these functions and how you can kind of go a little, dig a little bit deeper uh, with some of these. So I'm going to bring that up for a moment just to kind of let you take a look. Get this out of my way. Okay, this is not the right place. So this is chapter two now, by the way. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff we were just talking about, page 31, if you wanted to take a look at where we're getting this. So 
So here we're, we're starting to take a look at, okay, how do we, how do we know when stuff is coming out? Um, yeah, we can, we can get in a little more complicated and be solving systems in terms of, okay, what's the flow rate, the volume, what mass did we add? Um, and, you know, what's the concentration at that given time? So there's, there's ways we can dig in deeper and derive equations that we can, we can really map out these curves um, if we know a little bit about the systems. Um, but mostly what I'm interested in you knowing is kind of how these essentially work together so that if you did have to go design a system like this, you understand the concept and know, you know that there's ways to, um, to calculate the things that you need from a residence time distribution like this, right? I also would like to, you know, by the end of today's lecture, hof hopefully you get a, a decent idea of what it looks like when there's a reactor that's performing poorly and how we can maybe see what, uh, what the residence time distribution implies about the reactor itself. Okay, so a little bit about tracers here. Um, tracers, what we want is something that is, first of all, traceable. Um, so we don't want it reacting, um, we don't want it changing the system. So the criteria here, we'll go ahead and start with number one. We don't want anything different than water in terms of how it acts, right? We want it to have no buoyancy, no um, change in viscosity, which would kind of affect, you know, number two. It's going to be traveling with the water with no, with no caveats, right? Nothing. It's not going to stick to the walls of the reactor. It's not going to do anything weird. Um, you, you know, we could add particles, but they better not float, you know, better not have buoyancy or negative buoyancy. Um, if we do that, then they have to be acting just like water. And sometimes you will, you, you do use um, particles when you're doing a challenge test or something to see okay, how many particles are, is a system going to remove. And the same sort of thing applies if you're, you want to be able to detect the particles. So uh, I briefly worked on a project when I was a grad student some one time where we were using fluorescent um, microspheres. So little tiny little plastic beads that had the fluorescent dyes in them. So then we could detect them with a spectrofluorimeter um, and we just basically see how many of these beads are going to be removed by this filtration was the idea. So that's, that um, is a similar topic there. Uh, but again, you, you want it to be behaving the same in general. You don't want it to change the water, changing the viscosity or anything. Um, so it's probably important if you're adding a lot of it to have it at the same temperature of your water. You don't want it to be reactive because you don't want to have to worry about how much is decaying over time, right? If you had a system and you're trying to determine the, the hydraulics of it, but then you have something with even a known reaction rate, then that's just going to complicate everything quite a bit and may even obscure stuff to the point where uh, you don't even know how much of it was residing there for a really long time, maybe stuck somewhere, and you just never saw it. You know, that, that would just create lots of problems. You don't want it to be reactive. Um, you want to be able to easily measure the concentration and uh, at low levels. So it's got to be something that's um, easy to observe and easy to observe at small concentrations. Uh, and finally, particularly for uh, drinking water, but also like this example, this guy out in nature trying to understand the uh, hydraulics, hy hydrology of a, uh, a stream there better. You don't want it to be toxic or unsafe for consumption or for wildlife in that case. Um, so if you're doing it in wastewater, you can maybe get away with a little more, but still you want it to be non-toxic. Um, if you're doing, if you're drinking water, Ideally, you want to use something that nobody's going to complain about or even notice. So this is why <clears throat> we actually often use fluoride for drinking water. That gives us a, a health benefit, and so normally we're adding fluoride anyway, but F minus 
this uh, small amount of this, too much of it is a problem, but small amounts of it uh, is very good for our dental hygiene. It reacts with uh, the calcium appetite in our teeth. Uh, I believe that's the, the reaction. And essentially strengthens the enamel quite a bit. So um, people who have grown up without fluoride in their drinking water tend to have lots more dental caries, cavities, um, and stuff like that. So it's, it's been a, a great benefit in the right dose. And so it's, not, it's really not a problem to spike a little bit of fluoride into the system, maybe turn off the normal fluoride doser or whatever, or move it to the front of the reactor and test and see, okay, how much, you know, how quickly is this fluoride coming through? And to detect it, then you'd need to, to perform some reaction in the water, probably a colorimetric method, add something, you know, you take your sample and then you add it and detect that in the lab. You could use um, rhodamine red dye. It's used fairly often. That's what's going on here. Um, that's this molecule. You probably don't want that in your drinking water just because people will be like, Ew, why is my, my water red? That's not good. Um, but it's, you know, it'd be like food coloring. You put food coloring in your food and you don't complain. You know, you eat M&Ms without complaining. Um, why don't you drink your red water? Come on. <laughs> so it's uh, not realistic to do that to people. Um, and once you have chlorine in there, it's probably, the chlorine will probably attack it and bleach it anyway. But um, it, it certainly can be used and is used sometimes as well. Okay, so with those criteria, um, there's, it, it really does narrow it down a bit. There's probably a few others that are used, but those are the two uh, main ones um, that we think about. Okay, we have uh, a couple ways we add the tracer to a system. And what I already mentioned both, really. It's either a pulse, like an instant, I added a five kilogram pack of dye to this massive reactor, um, or maybe I, 10 drops of uh, food coloring to my, my little reactor. Whatever it is, we're adding some um, as a pulse, a discrete quantity of it. And then we can talk about the, this exit age now in terms of the flow rate divided by the mass we put in times the concentration. And this kind of is what those equations were being built from, I, I showed you a moment ago. Um, essentially, we have Q times C. So this will be uh, volume, volume per time, units times, we'll say, mass per volume. And then also the mass on the bottom, 1 over mass. So what we see is we have masses cancel, volumes cancel, and we're left with one over time, which is what we expected, right? So this is, this is just essentially showing us that we can take the concentration we added, multiply that by the flow rate, divide that by the total mass that we added. That's giving us how much has come through at that time t. So we measure the, we measure the concentration at the time t, right? So it's um, relatively straightforward when you think about it, and then it's intuitive, but it's, um, yeah, that, that's a, a function that gives us, um, based on the concentration we're measuring at a given time, if we know that flow rate, we know how much we added, then we can predict the, the E of T, or we can uh, just, we cannot predict, we can uh, define it that way. Okay, we can also do, uh, simplify this a little bit or rewrite it if we divide both the, the top and the bottom here by volume Q over V is essentially 1 over theta it's like the inverse of or excuse me 1 over tau the hydraulic resonance time that's um, if we take Q divided by V and then we take mass divided by volume and we still have the concentration there, then essentially what we're going to end up with is um, the, this concentration over here is actually mass per volume, right? So this is also mass per volume. We're going to end up with 
Um, let's see. This is the uh, the mass total, and this is the mass current. So if you simplify from there, you end up getting it to the point where we have, um, and I put a theta here, I'm sorry. I meant to put a tau for our hydraulic resonance time. Um, so we, uh, if we get that, we have this E of T equal to the concentration we're observing divided by the initial concentration we added times the hydraulic resonance time. Okay, then we can also uh, say that by integrating this from zero to t, um, that equation is essentially our cumulative, right? Our cumulative is just the sum of um, this e of t function. Okay, so that's that holds true for our pulse inputs. Um, we need to know that initial concentration uh, or the initial mass that we added. So the initial mass divided by the total volume of the system is going to give us our initial concentration. Okay, so what does this look like in terms of how it works? Um, here, we're, we're going to go a little more in depth, but this is just a glimpse of an ideal plug flow reactor and an ideal um, CSTR, where we have at time zero, Let's look at the left panel first. Time zero, we've pulsed to that input. We've added a plug of dye. And then in an ideal reactor, exactly at our hydraulic residence time, we get that whole amount of dye back out instantly, right? That's, that's kind of the, uh, the theory here. We have some normalized concentration. I don't know why they're taking that above one. I would think this should stop here. <laughs> um, so we add this amount of dye, and then we wait. It goes through the, through the reactor, and when it exits, we have all of that dye come through perfectly. So that's, a, that's the ideal plug flow reactor. In the ideal CSTR, what happens if we add a pulse of dye is that we have um, essentially immediate and perfect mixing through the system. So as soon as we add that, we have some, some concentration of that dye coming out that's essentially the, um, the initial concentration. It's, it starts coming out at the initial concentration because the whole system um, instantly became that initial concentration. So that's the amount that's coming out immediately. We're not adding any, so we can see that essentially you know, when we think about the CSTR, we have some volume, and in that volume we have C. And a lot of times we'll have some Q and a C naught coming in, and the QC going out, this C being the same as this one, right, because of that perfect mixing. In this case, we have no, you know, it, it's just a pulse, so we have no C naught. It's C naught is zero. So this it goes away. Um, and so essentially what happens is we have that immediate mixing, starts at that initial concentration, and then we see the accumulation happening negatively in the system. So this is not at steady state because you know, what we have concentration leaving and nothing being added after, the, after, the pulse, uh, after we added the pulse. So this is actually just a plot of exactly how much concentration is in the system itself. Um, as well as the, the tracer test for us. And so we see that decay over time uh, coming out the output. And we'll notice here, this is an ideal reactor. And to find tau then, this should define, um, let's see, would that be exactly half of the system? I'm not sure. Uh, we'd have to take a look at the... Um, the math on that. Uh, but, but we could certainly define tau and then know something about how much has come out and how much has not. Um, and so just the reactor design itself, even in the ideal case, is definitely going to affect what this, um, 
residence time distribution looks like. Okay, so I have a few videos to, to share as well um, on that note. So this one's just simply a, a pulse input into a batch reactor. So if you wanted to look at how well is your batch reactor mixing, um, this is an example of that. Uh, you could also imagine this is kind of what it would look like in a continuously stirred tank reactor if you had flow going through it. So it just added a little bit of um, dye to it there. Just one more time here. See, just the, get to see that dye adding, and we can see it's not perfectly mixed. It didn't happen instantly, right? There was, um, there was some some stuff happened. You know, some amount of time before it was well mixed there. Uh, all right. So we saw this one already, um, but again, this is a a good depiction of. Um, a plug flow reactor that's not ideal and having what we call the step input, it's continuous input, whereas that previous one was just like a, a squirt of dye. Um, we'll come back to this one again um, a little bit later talking about the plug flow reactors. And this is also a good one. Um, this is essentially modeling a plug flow with dispersion, which we're about to talk about. So we've got this chamber and this plug of something moving through it, and we see this um, expansion of this uh, tracer uh, laterally in both directions based on diffusion and um, maybe dispersion there as well. And we, we can see that, that profile then, how, how quickly it comes out um, or how slowly. And so this is a, a, a good computational um, approach here. Okay, and I think the, the follow through, oh, that's, one of these had a decent um, follow through for the next video. Okay, come back to the slides. Maybe it was just the autoplay that I had that one time. Let me check this real quick. That's definitely not it. Okay. Well, I should have written it down when I had it. There's a couple other videos that I thought were helpful. Okay. Anyway, so those are the ideal cases for a pulsed input. Now let's talk about step inputs. So if we're continuously adding dye. So if we've we've got a system where we, we go from zero concentration straight up to our initial concentration in terms of what we're adding to the system and then we continue to add that into our system. If that's our case then we have our we, we're adding it until what's coming out the end is equal to what what we're adding right so the C in the effluent is equal to C in the influent. So up until we reach that point, we're doing this tracer test. So that's going to give us a, a description of how long it takes before we see exactly what we're putting in coming out the other end. So it's going to be a lot more dye. It'll be more expensive that way. Um, but it'll give us, um, again, some pretty good information here. OK, so we can, we can take a look at this and uh, Again, we have this function of at some time when the sample is taken, we can know that we can say that the concentration of our dye or our tracer is equal to this um, cumulative function at that time multiplied by the initial concentration. And then essentially, this uh, term that goes to zero over here is. Um, 
this is the stuff that was added before time equals zero. So this just goes to zero. So if we had some amount of dye coming in before we started adding the dye, that's, that's what this term would account for. Um, so this is essentially before t equals zero. Now, this would only be relevant if you did have, and then this the zero wouldn't be there, um, if you had maybe some sort of a tracer, let's say you were using fluoride and there was a little bit of fluoride in the water already, then you would maybe need to account for that um, in that way. So otherwise, it, it just becomes essentially the concentration that you're observing is equal to that um, function, the uh, that cumulative function times what you what you were starting with. So it ends up simplifying quite a bit. Um, we can rewrite that and say that that f of t function is equal to c of t divided by the c input. Um, so it actually comes, kind of comes back to um, the same type of math we were looking at previously. Okay, so not not a lot else to say there. Again, you can you can do more math with this to to better understand the the system. But the the basics are that we're just looking at this cumulative system, and by measuring uh, how much we're getting out, we can relate that to how long it's been in there, and therefore some of the, the reactor dynamics. Okay, so looking at these in ideal reactors. Mentioned this already. Um, for a plug flow reactor, the uh, the ideal case was not this one, right? And it was also not not this other one where we had that computational simulation. This would be maybe an ideal reactor with dispersion or, or diffusion or something. Um, rather, we have that that pulsed or step input where we had, you know, if we if we did a pulse, then it it looked like this, and then it came out like that as well sometime later. Um, in the case of a step input, we stepped it up. At time zero, we started adding this amount, and we kept adding it until we had that much coming out. And so it was instant. Whereas a non-ideal reactor would, would have some tailing, and it would end up looking like that. Um, so the, there's uh, different ways we can approach the the math of the plug flow reactor. They get it, they get into uh, this um, Eulerian view and the Lagrangian view and stuff like that. Uh, essentially, just different ways of defining uh, mathematically what's happening in these in the plugs and in the reactor. Um, not too worried about that. Um, I will say though, one of the techniques we can use to um, describe non-ideal reactors in kind of simpler terms is also one way we can describe an ideal plug flow reactor. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So in an ideal CSTR, we have, again, that um, if we take a look at what's coming out uh, after a, a pulsed input, it's initially the initial concentration comparison for what we put in divided by the initial in there. We start at one, and then it's essentially draining out slowly. Or we could take the, the natural log of that plot, and it becomes linear. So we see that it's, there, there's a function that's exponential. Um, it's an exponential decay here is what that means. And I'm sure that we could uh, derive that equation from the mass balance if we wanted to. OK, so that's um, basically it. If we were adding the same amount, if we were doing a step addition to a CSDR, um, it would essentially just stay at 1 in the ideal case, right? Because we're adding that same amount the whole time. It's completely mixed. So whatever that concentration is is whatever it stays at if, if we're doing a step uh, addition. In a non-ideal case, um, sometimes we might have short circuiting. So water, um, we're adding it at the beginning, and some of it escapes immediately. So we have some 
uh, let's see, that would mean we have perhaps even greater than one concentration because it hasn't diluted throughout the whole volume yet. So we might actually have kind of a, a spike and then lowering, let's see. And then maybe we have dead volume spaces uh, so it takes longer for stuff to come out. So maybe in a very non-ideal reactor, we'd have too much coming out at first and then like, this isn't really drawn to scale because my f fractions are wrong, but maybe it takes too long for stuff to come out after that. Um, so there's different, different ways where something could happen, right? If we have that dead volume, some dye gets in it and stays there for a very long time, and so we see stuff coming out a very long time later, or maybe we have that poor mixing and some of it just comes out in bulk before it has mixed through the whole system. So those two things can happen in a non-ideal case, um, whereas we've just got this nice exponential decay in that perfectly mixed case. Okay, so non-ideal reactors then, um, and just a, a few pictures from our book here. We can take a look at a plug flow reactor, and if we have some input concentration that we're, that we're looking at, and what's coming out, we can see that essentially, you know, if it was ideal, you, you know, I think this case here is showing that our input was not perfect, right? Which is what we expect. We, we don't expect to be able to have the perfect syringe to like perfectly mix across a plug and that's that. It'd be, it's actually an interesting de design challenge, kind of taking a look back here. You know, what did they do to, to get the system to add the dye like they wanted it to. You can see even at the starting conditions there's some discrepancy here. Some of it's um, not perfectly mixed vertically like, like we would want it to be, but they did a pretty good job. So there's, there's some questions there about how do you even input it in the first place. And then um, if it was ideal, an ideal plug flow reactor, you'd expect that exact same profile coming out. Um, but if you end up seeing this thing here, then what we're looking at is uh, certainly some of it is being delayed. S looks like maybe, yeah, if we were to put these on top of each other, you know, it looks something like that. So probably nothing's coming out early, but certainly there's a lot of lag time for, for a fair bit of it. So the, the sharper the peak we end up getting, the, the more ideal it is. Um, so this is pretty far from ideal, it seems uh, to me. And you can do some comparison with, like they're doing in this uh, third plot here, um, kind of comparing what we expected to be the um, the time it takes before some amount comes through versus the actual time it took for that amount to come through. Okay, so how do we model these? Um, if we've got some non-ideal system, we want to use the math that we know about um, and not some computational simulation thing. Um, how do we do it? Well, there's uh, a few approaches that we can use. And what I'm going to say is essentially what we're going to do is you know, we can look at a, a scale of the non-ideal non reactors from, um, from a scale of plug flow reactors. So, you know, in terms of what we have, um, the reactors that we have, right? We have non-mixing plug flow reactors on one end of the spectrum. This is you know, if we go all the way to the left here, this is ideal. If we go all the way to the right here, we have perfect mixing. CSDRs. And if we look at our, our dynamics, these are our two extremes. These are our two types of reactors that we deal with. And they are, you know, diametrically opposed here. Reality is somewhere in between. 
right? So um, the question is, did we want our, our CSDR to be acting like a plug flow reactor? Probably not, um, but maybe it, you know, maybe it is. Chances are, if we designed a CSTR, maybe we've got some performance over here. If we designed a plug flow reactor, maybe our performance is over here. Um, but what we can see here is that if we were to take a look at these systems in terms of the resonance time distributions, they're going to be um, somewhere on the spectrum between these two extremes. It's going to be that pulse coming through and all of it comes through at once or it's going to be continuous. We're not going to go further in one, one or the other directions. So that means we, we may be able to make use of combinations of plug flow reactors and CSTRs, ideal ones, because the, the math for the ideal ones is rather simple. Um, maybe we can combine them uh, to come up with a reasonable estimation of what's going on. OK, so there's, there's four things we do. Uh, four cases, common models that we use to simulate the non-ideal conditions. The first would be a plug flow reactor with dispersion. And that's uh, very similar to this little video, right? This one, I think we might call that mostly diffusion. Um, but I think the, intuitively what, you, what we're seeing here is the same process you would be using. Okay, adding in... Um, the, the, into the model here that dispersion term and I'll, I'll write a, some equation to show you what that would look like to, to account for that um, in a minute. <clears throat> the second would be a number of equal size CSDRs in series. So instead of having one perfectly mixed CSDR, maybe we have maybe we can model it as a CSTR, another CSTR, and a third CSTR, that pushes us a little closer to the plug flow reactor. Um, and again, I'll, I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Third, we could combine CSTRs and plug flow reactors, um, possibly with dead spaces accounted for. So we'll talk a little bit about dead spaces. And last would be a network of several plug flow reactors in parallel or in series with multiple inputs and outputs. So there's, there's certainly um, more and more complex things we can do, but by networking them, we can, we can account for some of the weird stuff we see coming out of our, our actual systems. Okay, so regarding dispersion here, um, if we, if we want to take a look and we have, we have some model, um, as we're modeling them, we can see some examples here of uh, changing, these, changing these model parameters, moving things about, and trying to predict our experimental data with the model that we've got. And just kind of a, a brief look, if we were to take, take a look at what the math ends up to be to account for dispersion, it looks something like this, a uh, partial derivative here del C of, at, of x and t dt. So this is the, um, the partial of the concentration given the distance and time, so x and time. This is going to be equal to negative v in the x direction, so that's the velocity there del C, x in time, D, uh, del x should be. So we have this, uh, the velocity term, so that's going to be the advection, and then we're going to add um, diffusion. And then, so this is essentially the advection and what we'll call dispersion terms. 
Okay, and that's just in two dimensions. You could make this three dimensional and add the any z and y dimension velocity, which hopefully in a plug flow reactor would be negligible, but you know, maybe at a bend you have to do it. Um, and then the dis diffusion, it shouldn't, you know, theoretically, again, if you have a plug moving through a pipe, the any motion of stuff, dispersion sideways or up and down shouldn't matter. It's just that the x direction in this case. Um, so theoretically, you just need that x component, but you can uh, imagine this this is the same transport process, the same type of math we see in other transport processes um, would certainly apply here. Okay. Um, the idea of doing CSTRs in series. So this one I think is actually kind of interesting. So in the simple case, we have this big CSTR. It's supposedly well mixed, but we know that it's too big to really have realistic mixing from the start to the, to the finish instantaneously. Um, so with that in mind, it's often a better model to split this up into several CSDRs and, you know, go from, uh, from the input into tank one, then to two, three, four, and so on. Um, and in this case, they, we've divided this CSDR into four tanks. Now, if we were to do this an infinite number of times, that ends up approximating a plug flow reactor. So if you remember, we were, we were talking about going from one extreme to the other, if we had the CSTR in that case, and we had um, an infinite number of CSTRs, that's just a plug flow reactor. Um, because a plug flow reactor is essentially, if we think about it this way, each plug is well mixed within itself and it's pouring its water into the next plug over. Um, if we were to think about it as stationary plugs, then it's just like a bunch of CSTRs, infinite number, because it's an infinitely small plug, infinite number of them, that gives us the same math as the, um, the uh, plug flow reactor. Another thing to note here is when we draw these, if we take a moment to think back on the math that we derived for these reactors last time. If let's say we have this Q and we have N naught and N1. We could then say in this case we have N naught, N1, N2, N3, and N4. We, were, we derived the uh, equation for the a mass balance with let's say you know, what we did in class, I believe, was a steady state first order decay reaction. And that gave us n, well, let's start with just n. It gave us n equals n naught over 1 plus tau k, right? That was the mass balance we derived when we were trying to find what's coming out of the system uh, given what we started with. And so that would, in the uppercase, that would be N1. We can rewrite that and say N1 over N0 equals 1 over 1 plus tau k. Now, what we can do here if we want to know, you know, to, to combine this model to make it, to, to do the math to find this, um, this analogy that's giving us a, a model for the, the realistic system that's not ideal. You know, we we're using multiple ideal smaller reactors, pretending, it, pretending this big reactor has smaller ones in it as a way to predict with our ideal case, our ideal math, what's happening in reality, right? That's, that's what we're doing here. So if we're gonna do it with this, if we're gonna do that, then what we need to know to find this N4, we need to account for all four of those. So what we, what we find is we can combine them by saying N1 over N0. We multiply that by N2 over N1 and N3 over N2 and N4 over N3. This is going to give us our answer that we're looking for because 
what, we're in, what we know is how much we're putting in, and what we want to know is N4. So we need to get to N4 somehow. By multiplying them this way, we're going to get rid of the N1s, we're going to get rid of the N2s, and we're going to get rid of the N3s. But when we do this, we then have to say this equation for each of these cases needs to get put in there. And so if they're all exactly the same size, then the tau is the same for each of them. Um, so we'll say tau 1 equals tau 2 equals tau 3. They don't have to. Um, and then we just have to put in these separately into our equation. But when we do this, if we do multiply all of these, that's the same thing as saying 1 over 1 plus tau 1 times k times 1 over 1 plus tau 2 k. You know, and I'm assuming the k's are the same here. Maybe we have different reactions or something. 1 over 1 plus tau 3 and so on. If all of these are the same tau and same k, so if this is true, then we get 1 over 1 plus tau k to the fourth power. And so that's, that ends up being our simple case. If we were to take that and say we have an infinite number of them, we put an infinity there, and then I think we, maybe that's a, a Taylor expansion or something like that, then we get to our plug flow reactor math. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head how that works to do the math, so I'm not going to do that for you. I'm just going to admit that I don't remember. Um, but but it essentially, it, that is the math and that is how it connects. So that's kind of, kind of a cool concept there, and I wanted to walk you through this because this is the way we can combine when we have multiple reactors in a system. How do we, how do we combine them? Well, usually we just take the mass balance and convert it into a form where we have that ratio of what's coming in compared to what's going out. And we can do that for a plug flow reactor. We can do that for a CSTR. Um, they're different, but it's no problem to do it, right? It's either, you know, and it depends on the reaction order and the, whether it's growth or decay, what it actually ends up looking like. But it's, it's similar. Um, if, you know, if this was growth, this would probably be a minus there. But then we can multiply these across that way to, to compare what's coming in to what's going out and combine these reactors in that manner. OK, so that's essentially the, the crux of combining the reactors. Now, if we were to do it um, for the, the models three and four, where we're combining, um, combining CSTRs and plug flow reactors, we could do it that way if they're in series. If they're in parallel, we need to split the flow and handle it a little bit differently in terms of the math. But at that point, we would be taking, you know, if we had a, a system where we, we took a plug flow reactor and a CSTR, and then combined these, we would have to um, split take account for the different volumes and the it would essentially be uh, let's call this and not and n1 this would be n not and n2 we could then we'd have to combine these two here and it, it would essentially be maybe half the flow is going into either we would we would have this uh, N1 over N0 plus N2 over N0 um, given, uh, you know, given the, the right way to combine the flows. You know, if they were the same flows, it would be no problem. And then um, essentially, it's, it's an addition to do them in parallel um, compared to the multiplication when they're in series. Okay. So that said, there's just a couple quick things I want to make note of in, in these cases, because if we start, if we want to account for the dead volume, there's another step we can take. 
So first of all, we need to recognize that effective, the effective volume in a reactor is going to be less than the total volume that we built, if there's dead volume. Um, dead volume meaning there's like a corner of the reactor that's just stagnant, doesn't mix well, it's just kind of sitting there. Uh, for all intents and purposes, it's kind of dead. Um, so we can say that that dead volume is just equal to the total minus the effective volume that we find that effectively we have some amount of volume. So maybe 3% of a reactor is dead, um, dead zones. Okay, the book provides us a, a parameter to describe the mean detention time of a tracer. They actually use T with a bar above it. I couldn't find that in PowerPoint, so I just wrote it below it. Um, this mean detention time, uh, we can use that and compare that with the design retention time. And we can say that that ratio of the average detention time that we observe compared to the design uh, hydraulic retention time, we can set that equal to the V effective divided by Q. So V over Q is the, is the tau. So it's basically tau effective divided by tau um, design. So that, that's just a simple relationship we can put and we can take a look at the fractional dead space, you know, what fraction of it is dead space by taking that equation and saying one minus the, the volume of the effective or divided by the volume of the total. Um, that's the same thing as saying one minus that um, mean detention time of the tracer divided by the design volume. Okay, and there's, a, there's some interesting uh, graphs. I, I probably should have just left this um, a little larger. So what I'm going to do is just for a moment expand that um, portion for you. Actually, you know what, I'll pull it up in the book instead. That'll be better. Um, I was just thinking it, it might be interesting to, to take a look at um, these here, the um, these um, non-ideal reactors kind of taking a look at a tracer test that comes through and if it looks like this with all these uh, random random things then we can model it with different um, plug flow reactors and CSDRs based on what it looks like you know maybe maybe one portion looks like it's a CSDR one portion kind of looks more like a plug flow reactor that's this big and then has this amount of dead volume things like that um, and you can do the same thing. That would be the, the E of T version, and this down here, the cumulative F of T version. And uh, just combining those together is kind of a, an interesting thing to think about how that would end up looking. Um, and you have on the bottom here, this is like tau 1, tau 2, tau 3 for the different reactors we're putting in place um, to, uh, to model that. OK, last thing I want to say is there are some simple indices of hydraulic behavior that are used in practice. Um, so from the book here, we have um, indicators of how ideal or how non-ideal a system is. And it, it's pretty common to take this uh, T10, T50, or T90, the time it takes for 10% of the volume to come through, 50% of the volume, or 90% of the volume to come through, and compare that to the hydraulic retention time. So if we, again, think about that ideal plug flow reactor, the time at which it takes 100% of the volume to come through is exactly tau. So that would be one. So it would be, if, it, if the retention time is 10 minutes, we expect 100% of the stuff to come out at 10 minutes. So T50 over tau would be one. T or yeah, yeah, that would still be one because none of it comes out before then. Um, so, and so exactly like I was just saying, in a plug flow reactor that's ideal, we have one, 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 right? That's uh, all of these indices. You can also compare that T90 divided by T10. Um, that's another index that's used. In a CSTR, this, I, I'm assuming this, these two are ideal, right? This ideal plug flow, ideal CSTR here. 
10% of it will come out in uh, about 10% of the time, 10% uh, of the hydraulic resonance time. 50% of it will come out by, um, by the time we've gone through about 70% of the uh, time to tau. 90% of it comes out after 2.3 hydraulic resonance times. So it's, we can see um, just these, these basic indexes, um, indices we can use to compare what we observe in, our, in practice compared to these numbers and say, okay, we're pretty close, that's, that's pretty good. Or, oh, we're, we're really far off, maybe we need to um, account for some stuff here. Um, and then here we have this, this last one. If we take one reactor, one CSTR, and then we say, okay, well, let's split that into three and treat it that way, three CSTRs. Um, then um, that's this case here. So then we have, um, you know, slightly longer time for that 10%, longer time for the 50, um, but a little shorter time for 90% of the volume to come through. So essentially what that's done is we've gone from a system where we had this to something that I guess looks a little bit, um, it probably looks a little different, like uh, more like that or something, something like that. I didn't draw it to scale, but you can see how maybe that um, maybe that has that longer time for 50% of it, but shorter time for the 90%. Uh, there's one other thing that we have issues with that I forgot to mention. Um, I'll do that just real quick. Um, in addition to dead volume, we can also have short circuiting. And that's if we have a CSTR. Uh, I guess it could maybe happen with a plug flow reactor. That'd be kind of strange, though. We have a CSTR, an input and an output. Normally, what we want is for the water to come in and mix entirely. And as it's mixing, just some of it's coming out, right? It's perfectly mixed, and just some comes in and some goes out. Um, but in the short circuiting condition, what happens is some of the water just goes essentially straight through and doesn't end up getting mixed. So there's maybe some channel, a bit of flow. We can imagine this same phenomenon happens in like um, column-based reactors where channelization through the column media happens and water can just go kind of straight through. It's the same, I same idea here. A lot of times there'll be some sort of baffle to prevent this or whatever, but um, if, this, if a design is not done well, then we could have um, that tracer coming out very quickly. I mentioned that earlier, but I like, just wanted to kind of point out what that would look like is um, kind of circumventing the, the reactor volume. Um, okay, so that's all I've got. Um, any questions, thoughts? I've not uh, posted your assignment yet, but I, I will do that uh, probably by the end of the weekend. Um, that, so that you, I'm just basically going to give you dates. If you have some conflicts or something, let me know. Um, with six of you, I really don't mind too much dealing with um, more on an individual basis if there's some need or, or issue. So feel free to let me know. But the assignment will, you know, this, the two, um, the two uh, review assignments, again, that's kind of for your own benefit, hopefully that can connect with something you're interested in or already um, a tangent to what you're already researching um, to give you a way to, to write about it and review some papers and have some practice on that. All right, so with that, have a good weekend. And I'll